And so this morning, let's go ahead and open our Bibles there to Romans chapter 15. And uh, let's read together verses 14 through 33. And this is what Paul writes. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work of God or for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way to Illicrum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named. Lest I should build upon someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of Him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now since I am no longer, but now since I no longer have any room for work, now think about this verse. Think about it. Paul says, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions. You know what that means? That he's covered the whole region with the gospel. It's time to move on to somewhere else. That's amazing. He goes, I have no no more room to work in these regions. And since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. Once I have enjoyed your company for a while, at present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in the spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of Christ's blessing. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive with me in prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints." So that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I will tell you that probably as you read, you saw that this is an encouraging passage written to believers for the purpose of providing them what I believe are marks of a healthy church and also marks of a healthy Christian. That's the reason I've given the sermon the title this morning, Marks That Matter. Now, I'm not talking about the personal name Mark, even though all people who are named Mark do matter. I'm referring to the marks, the fruit that bear witness to who we truly are. I think in this passage, we see that those two things. I think we see the marks of a healthy church, and I believe that also we see the marks of a healthy Christian. Truly, in this passage of Scripture, you see the missionary heart of the Apostle Paul. Now, speaking of missionaries, I want to talk to you about one of my favorites. He is a man by the name of David Livingston. Now, one of the reasons I think that David Livingston is one of my favorites is because he was a man's man. He was was an explorer. He was a missionary. I believe that he was a man's man. He endured a lot during his time in Africa. His wife passed away. A lot of trials and tribulations. He wasn't a perfect man by any means. 
But God used David Livingston as a missionary to Africa. David Livingston was born on March the 19th, 1813, and he died May the 1st, 1873. For 30 years of his life, he spent it in an unwearied effort to evangelize the native races there in Africa, to explore undiscovered secrets, to abolish the desolating slave trade of Central Africa. And I just think that was remarkable. Not only did he go there to evangelize those who were lost and present the gospel to a place that had not heard, he explored new country, but he also sought to abolish the slave trade. He wrote this, All I can add in my solitude is, May heaven's rich blessing come down on everyone, America, English, and Turk, who will help to heal this open sore of the world. And primarily, he was speaking to slavery. He said, May the blessing of God come down on every American, every English, and every Turk who helps to heal the open sore of this world. And at that time, it was slavery. So God used David Livingston not only to pronounce the gospel in Africa and untold, I don't know, thousands who came to faith in Christ. He explored new territories and he also worked to abolish the slave trade. A remarkable man. One of the things that David Livingston said was this. People talk of sacrifice. I have, they talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice, which is simply paid back as a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us and for us. I have never made a sacrifice. Isn't that remarkable? How, how can this be considered a sacrifice? Spending so many of his years in a foreign country, losing his wife, not seeing family. He says, how can this be considered a sacrifice when all that Christ has done for me? Now, you're going to hear more quotes by David Livingston as we work our way through this message. But the reason I quote Livingston is because you truly see the heart of David Livingston. I got on to David Livingston uh, when I was traveling on a mission trip. One of the things I like to do when I go on a mission trip is to actually read a book, a biography of a missionary. And so on one trip when I was going to Bangladesh, I bought the, uh, the Truth Behind the Legend. That's the name of the book. The Truth Behind the Levin, Legend, the story of David Livingston. And I read that entire book and it was absolutely, absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Unbelievable. But he was a man who had a heart for the Lord and a heart for the gospel. We see that here in this passage as well as we look into the heart of the Apostle Paul. I think we would all agree that Paul was a very healthy Christian. But before we talk about the marks of a healthy Christian, let's first talk about the marks of a healthy church. And you see that in verse 14. Look at what Paul writes here. He says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves, talking about the church in Rome, he says, you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Those are the three things that Paul says about the church in Rome. The first one was what? He says that you're full of goodness. You are full of goodness. In other words, the members of the church at Rome were characterized by their charity and their love and their activity toward one another, but not, not only toward one another, but through their gospel proclamation throughout the Roman Empire. This church was zealous for the Lord. And for that reason, Paul commends them for being full of goodness. I would say to you this morning that one of the marks of a healthy church is that a healthy church is full of goodness. Now, when we hear that phrase, it may sound just a little bit subjective to us. 
What does Paul mean by being full of all goodness? Well, I want you to know as your pastor, I've done a little bit of research for us. And I want you to turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13 just for a moment. And we are going to answer that question. What does it mean to be full of goodness? Hebrews 13. This is what the Word of God says. Starting in verse 1. The author of Hebrews writes to the church. Notice these marks of goodness. Verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. That's good, isn't it? That's what it means to be full of goodness, is that we have brotherly love towards one another. He goes on to say in verse 2, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Love one another. Show hospitality to strangers. That's what it means to be full of goodness. In verse 4, he says this, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. To be full of goodness is to be a church that holds marriage in high honor. And let us remember that right now, in light of everything that's going on in our society and in our country, that God has not changed His mind about marriage. God created marriage between one man and one woman and anything else is a perversion of the truth. He says in verse 5, he says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So, a church that's full of goodness is a church that loves the Lord and not money and they're full of contentment in their heart. So a good church, a healthy church, loves Shows hospitality, upholds marriage, biblical marriage. It keeps their life from the love of money. They're content with what they have. And then in verse 7, look at what he says. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. They have strong leaders. And not only do they have strong leaders, but they are are to remember their leaders. They are to think about their pastor. They're to pray for their pastors. And the pastors have a responsibility to live our lives in such a way that we exemplify true faith. And, and when you see that you, are, you, that, you you are to remember us in a good way. Don't forget your pastors. He says in verse 9, he says, do not be led away by diverse and strained teaching. In other words, a healthy church that's full of goodness is, does not allow false doctrine in the church. They're biblically sound, they're doctrinally sound, and they will not tolerate any false doctrine that deviates from the truth. He says in verse 17, Obey your leaders. And submit to them. And again, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Again, he's talking about past, pastoral leadership. Oh, you know, he says, obey your leaders. Then he says, submit to them. Why? Because God has given them the responsibility to watch over your soul. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's many ways, but one specific, specific way that we do that is through the pulpit ministry of the church. Right now, through the preaching of the word, and singing songs that are theologically rich, what do we do? We help watch over the souls of the believer. That's one of the, that's the reason that uh, even though connection groups are our primary strategy, the primary ministry of the church specifically is the pulpit ministry. The preaching of the word of God on a week by week basis. So he says, pray. A mark of a healthy church that's full of goodness? Praise. You see that in verse 18. So we go back to Romans 15 and Paul says one of the marks of a healthy church is that they're full of goodness. And to be full of goodness means that you have brotherly love. It means that you show hospitality. It means that you uphold the honor of marriage as defined in the word of God. You keep yourself free from the love of money. You're content with what God's blessed you with. You remember your leaders. You're not led away by false teaching. You obey your leaders. You submit to them. And you 
pray. And then he says in verse, I'm sorry, I skipped past Hebrews too, too quick. But then in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, he says, Now may the God of all peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good. So in Hebrews 13, right after that passage we just read, Paul identifies those things as good. Paul goes on to say, That a second mark of a healthy church is that it has knowledge. He says in verse 14 of Romans 15, I myself am satisfied with you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. And then he says, secondly, you are filled with all knowledge. Now that doesn't mean we're omniscient and we know all things. So what does it mean when Paul says that we have all knowledge? He's saying that a healthy church is a church that is theologically sound and doctrinally rich. They have a thorough comprehension of what is taught in the Bible. I believe that probably what Paul has in mind in this immediate context is what he's been teaching in the book of Romans. So if a healthy church has all knowledge, what does that mean? It means that they realize that all people are sinners without exception and they need to be saved. They realize that the Mosaic law, though good, holy, cannot counteract the power of sin. They realize that through the righteousness of God, sin is judged and salvation is provided. They have the knowledge that with the coming of Jesus Christ, the the former age of redemptive history has passed, passed away and a new age of redemptive history has begun. They have the knowledge that the atoning death of Jesus is central to God's plan of salvation. They have the knowledge that salvation is by justification, by faith alone. They also have the knowledge that there is a certain hope of future glory for those who are in Christ Jesus. They are those who who realize that Christ died. And now through Christ, we are enabled by the Holy Spirit to live the new life that He's called us to live. Furthermore, they have the knowledge that God is sovereign over salvation. He works all things according to His plan. Furthermore, they have the knowledge that God fulfills His saving promises to both Jews and Gentiles. And they have the knowledge that the grace of the gospel calls Christians to personal holiness, mutual service, good citizenship, and wholehearted neighbor love in Jesus. I just expounded for you in that brief time every chapter of the book of Romans. So, a healthy church is theologically rich, doctrinally sound, full of goodness. And then what does Paul go on to say? The third thing, and they're able to instruct one another. Again, this is presupposing that the believers in the church have a a sufficient knowledge of the Word of God, and they're able to communicate that. But Paul says they're able to instruct one another. We're able to guide one another. We're able to teach one another. I believe that included in this is not only encouragement by way of teaching, but also rebuke in way of church discipline. These things are all essential to a healthy church. So a healthy church is full of goodness, has all knowledge concerning redemptive history and is able to instruct one another, to give one another good, solid biblical advice, to answer questions and to give strong biblical counsel to those who are in need. We move from there and now we see the marks of a healthy Christian. The marks of a healthy Christian. Paul says in verse 15, But some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace of God given to me. Look at what he says here. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel so the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What a profound passage. Paul says that my ministry is a priestly ministry To offer the Gentiles up to God. Do you know what he's referring to? He's referring to the gospel. So one of the marks of a healthy Christian is a healthy Christian has a gospel heart. 
They have a heart for the gospel. And they have a heart to lead those who are lost to faith in Christ. We cannot describe, our, describe ourselves as healthy Christians if we're not seeking to win people to the Lord. If we're not seeking to proclaim the gospel with the expectation that people are going to be saved. Paul says, listen, my ministry that was given to me by God is a priestly ministry. So Paul is drawing our attention all the way back to the Old Testament. And he wants us to picture in our mind the Old Testament temple. And during that time, what would the priest do? The priest would kill a sacrifice, and then they would offer that sacrifice to God for the atonement of sin. And Paul says, that's how I see my ministry. I am a priest who is offering a sacrifice to God. And the offering that I am, or the sacrifice that I am offering is the lost souls of the Gentiles. You realize that we all are priests? Every one of us. We are a holy priesthood. This is what the Word of God teaches. This is what Peter said. You are a priest. That means you have responsibility and obligation. And what is that? To offer sacrifices to God. Not dead sacrifices. Paul told us in Romans chapter 12... Living sacrifices, sacrifices of praise, but also the sacrifice of leading those who are lost to faith in Jesus. Every lost person that we win to Christ is an offering to God. So a healthy Christian has a gospel heart. It was Livingston who said, I'd rather be in the heart of Africa in the will of God than on the throne of England out of the will of God. What a gospel heart. He goes, I'd rather be in the heart of Africa doing the will of God than on the throne of England out of the will of God. Only people with gospel hearts and a desire to see those who are lost come to faith in Christ could say such things. So just as we see the marks of a healthy church in this passage, we also see the marks of a healthy Christian. And one mark is a gospel heart. The second mark is a glorifying heart. A glorifying heart. Look at what he says in verse 17. In Christ Jesus then, I have reason to be proud of my, of my work for God. Now, if we stop right there, we may say, well, Paul's boasting. You're right, he is boasting, but he's not boasting in himself because you have to read verse 18. He says, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around Eliacrum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. What a glorifying heart he had. Not to glorify himself, but to glorify God. He says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has done through me. A healthy Christian has a gospel heart and a glorifying heart. They are constantly seeking to glorify God in all things. They're seeking to give Him praise, to give Him all the credit, to boast in God. Now, there are a lot of people who claim to be healthy Christians, but if you truly look at their heart, it would say something altogether different. You see, a healthy Christian, thirdly, has a going heart. A going heart. They're willing to go and take the gospel. Look at what he says in verse 19. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, that from Jerusalem, look here, all the way around to Eliakim, about 1,500 miles. About 1,500 miles. Not on an airplane. Not on a train. But with sandals. On his feet. 
from Jerusalem all the way to Eliakim. Look here. This isn't boasting. I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. What does that mean? He says in that 1,500 miles region, I have, there is a gospel witness everywhere because of my ministry. Paul would be the type of guy who would come to, he would come to Oklahoma City or even Oklahoma, and he would say, is there a gospel witness there? Oh, there is. I better go somewhere else. There was no gospel witness at this time, but through Paul's ministry, there was now a gospel witness in that 14 to 1500 mile radius. So you know what he said? My work here is done. I need to go on to the next one. Oh, he had a going heart. Look at what he says in verse 20. Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named. I want to go where nobody's ever heard of him. Many of us are, and it's good, but many of us are so focused on the second coming and we fail to realize that there's people around the world who have never heard of the first coming. And that was a a quote from a missionary. I just don't know who said it. So we look at this, and Paul had a going heart. Paul was willing to leave the area that he had been preaching, and what was his heart's desire? His heart's desire was to go to Spain. That's what was next on his agenda. You see that in the passage that we read earlier. Look at verse 24. I hope to see you passing as I go to Spain. Nobody knows really whether or not Paul made it to Spain or not. Academia says Paul never made it to Spain. Church history says Paul made it to Spain. We don't know whether or not Paul made it to Spain. But we do see his heart. A going heart, a glorifying heart, a gospel heart. Are these not the marks of a healthy Christian? David Livingston said this, I want to go anywhere. He says, I'll go anywhere long as it's forward. I'll go anywhere as long as it's forward. Now, of course... What does it mean to have a going heart? Does that mean that everybody in here, if you're not going on a for, or an international mission trip, then you're outside the will of God? No. No. There are those of us who God has led us to go to India and places like that in order to take the gospel into areas that haven't heard. But we can't go without you praying and without you sending and without you giving. But a going heart is much more than just going to an area where someone has never heard the gospel, which ought to be one of the priorities of the church. But for you personally, to have a going heart means that you're willing to go across the street, right, and seek to win your neighbor to faith in Christ. It also means that you give to your church in order to help others go to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's why I'm so thankful that in our recent decision and our budget changes that we are continuing to give to the International Mission Board through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering with the hopes of seeing more missionaries sent and more gospel proclamation in areas that have never heard. But let us not forget about our own Jerusalem. Let us not forget about our own neighbors, our own community. We must go. We must go with glorifying, gospel-centered hearts. Paul, fourthly, had a giving heart. He had a giving heart. And by the way, David Livingston also said this. He says, the best remedy for a sick church is to put it on a missionary diet. Your church unhealthy, it's sick, then get on a missionary diet. Isn't that good? 
Fourthly, Paul had a giving heart. He said, quoting in verse 21 there, he says from Isaiah, but as this is written, those who have never heard, who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Paul says, the word of God says this in the Old Testament, and I'm allowing God to use me as a means of fulfilling that passage But notice his giving heart. Not only did he give his life, but look here, verse 22. This is the reason I have come, that I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since, I no longer have any room for the work in these regions. Amen. (laughs) There's no more work to be done. There's a gospel witness everywhere. And since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. And once I've enjoyed your company for a while, at present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to the Gentiles. Why? For the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, and they ought to also be of service to them in material blessings. The Jerusalem church owes this to the Gentiles. But what I want you to see here is the giving heart of the Apostle Paul. He went throughout these regions not only proclaiming the gospel, but taking up offerings. And what was the purpose of the offerings? It was to help the church in Jerusalem. It was to help the poor, to make sure that their needs were met. Oh, what a giving heart the Apostle Paul had. He gave of himself personally, and he exhorted other churches to give also financially in order to help the poor. How can someone claim to be a healthy Christian who doesn't give to the work of the ministry? Paul did. Livingston did. They gave of themselves. Livingston said this, I will place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of Christ. If anything will advance the entrance of that interest of that kingdom, it shall be given away or kept only in reference to whether giving or keeping will most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time and eternity. He says, all I have is for the kingdom of God. And he says, the only way I determine whether I keep it or give it away is if it advances the glory of God among the nations. What a giving heart. Lastly, he had a grounded heart. His heart was grounded in prayer. We see this in verse 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. Look at what he says. Strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. And then he's specific. Pray that I may be delivered from unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you and with joy be refreshed in your company. Pray, he says. Pray with me. Pray. What a grounded heart. He understood that prayer was essential to everything. Paul prayed. He sought God's will continually. When David Livingston was found dead in Africa, do you know where they found him? They found him in his hut. He had been sick. They found him in his hut. And when they first walked in, they thought he was praying. He had been praying. As a matter of fact, he was kneeling down beside his cot. Praying when he died. What a grounded heart. I give you these takeaways. I think we come to the conclusion by, of this by saying a loyal Christian's heart is, number one, let me just walk through these. A heart that sees everything as sacred. This is just another way of saying everything I've already told you. A healthy Christian sees everything as sacred. A healthy heart is 
one that gives God the credit for everything. A healthy Christian is willing to go and to do whatever God commands. A healthy Christian is one who cares deeply for others. And a healthy Christian is one who prays passionately for the mission. I ask you, do we have the marks of a healthy church? Do you have the marks of a healthy Christian? When Paul was taking the missionary offering back to Jerusalem, he almost died. He was beaten and stoned and left for dead and shipwrecked, bitten by a snake and everything else. And eventually Paul did arrive in Rome, didn't he? In chains. What a heart he had for the Lord. When the natives found Livingston dead in an act of honor, they cut out his heart and they buried it under a tree in Africa and they sent his body back to England because Africa is where his heart was. As I was contemplating this sermon, there have been many people in this church who have, who have influenced my life. I think about Gary Ellis. If you were to cut out Gary Ellis' heart, you would have buried it underneath the foundation of this church because he loved this church. If you were to take Jack Kimbler's heart and bury it, you would have buried it right out there at Boys Ranch Town. Just to name a few. Where would your heart be buried? Where would your heart be buried? Underneath the rubble of stuff? Materialism? Would it be buried in your multiple storage sheds? underneath the rubble of stuff that you could sell and give away for the glory of God to the work of mission? But you know what? I can say the same thing about many of you in here. I look out across here and I see great hearts of people. And I am so thankful to pastor this church. But I ask you this morning, do you have the signs of a healthy Christian? If not, what are the changes that need to take place in your life in order to get you there? Amen. Let's bow in prayer. And as we're preparing to pray, let me just say first and foremost, your heart must be given to Christ. That's where it all begins. Jesus Christ died upon the cross in order to save us from sin. He was buried and he rose again. And the reason that Paul had the heart that he did was because of Jesus. He never got over the fact that Jesus died for him and Jesus gave all. I would say ultimately we are to look beyond Paul and especially up beyond Livingston and we are to look to Christ. We see the heart of Christ when he left the glories of heaven clothed in human flesh and he who knew no sin became sin and died upon the cross for our sin was buried and rose from the dead and Christ offers his heart he offers his life he offers his salvation to anyone who's ready and willing to receive him as Lord and Savior so here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And those of you who need to be saved, if you'd make your way to either myself or Pastor Jonathan and let us pray with you. Others of you this morning, maybe you just want to bow on your knees this morning like Livingston and just pray. Pray for the work of missions.
Pray for God to give you a missionary heart. Pray for God to help you to walk across the street and to share the gospel with your neighbor. Pray. Pray for those who are lost to be saved. Call them out by name. Pray for God to to help you to realign your life, to realign your giving, to giving, to realign your, your priorities in 2023, that your heart may be characterized as a gospel heart, a glorifying heart, a going heart, a giving heart, and a grounded heart, all to the glory of God. So, Father, we commit this time to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads? Let's stand.